In this module we begin to look at the question of the appraisal of development land. The economics of property development is a rather specialised and potentially very profitable area. And so it's one that employs quite a lot of real estate talent. As a property economist it's important for you to have a good understanding of the mechanics of property development and the development questions that arise along with it. In this module we'll be going through the basic economics of property development and we'll also be getting you to work through another self-correcting exercise, this time a development feasibility exercise. The important calculation in the development process is actually the estimation of value of the undeveloped land which is going to be developed. This can either be for a subdivision or it might be for the erection of some large and complex building, say a residential block of dwellings, or perhaps an office or residential complex. Regardless of what the development is, the important thing for the property economist to be aware of is that the land underneath the development will be acquired not for its value in its old land use, but rather for its value in connection with the land use that the developer is about to produce. This means we're necessarily looking at a new, highest and best use, one which is only released or enabled, if you like, as a result of the development process. From the landowner's point of view, while they are aware that the land is potentially able to be used for this land use or that land use, usually as a result of the existing planning legislation, because they haven't actually utilised that opportunity, their land is still lying dormant and enjoying the productivity of its old land use. The question becomes, who owns the value uplift as a result of the new land use? And how can it be captured most effectively by those parties who have the legal right to be able to do it? This is really the underlying question in the whole development equation. The nature of property rights is such that the owner at the time of the change of land use, certainly the uh, realisation of, of the new land use, is the person who has the legal right to enjoy the value uplift that comes from that newer, new highest and best use, even if that person doesn't personally be involved in using the property in that higher way. What this means is that the landowner who might only own a, uh, a farm or an old cottage or whatever it is, suddenly finds that their land is ripe for development into either a farm being developed into cottage lots or a bit of uh, urban land being redeveloped into some high-rise complex, even without actually doing the development themselves, the landowner at that point actually has the legal right to enjoy it, legal right to enjoy that value uplift. From a landowner's point of view, therefore, they're very interested in getting property economists to evaluate what the land value is under the highest and best use, which is released by the new land use. They do that by working out what's known as the residual land value. The residual land value is estimated by subtracting from the eventual property value, that's the total value of the finished development, subtracting from that the costs of development, including the costs of finance, and a reasonable rate of return to the developer. This simple equation realization, the end value of the development, minus all of the costs of development, including finance, profit and risk to the developer, means that the residual land value is exactly what it says, a residual. The land value is what pops out of the equation after you subtract the reasonable business costs involved in doing the construction of the development from the eventual value. The residual it all goes into the existing landowner's pocket, regardless of what input the existing landowner has into the realisation 
of that new and higher land use. Let's look now at the steps in the Turner model exercise. Turning to the exercise itself as you download it from Moodle, you'll see that it opens on a page which is simply called the introduction. If you read through the introduction, it goes through the steps that you must follow in order to build your own model. And as we go through the succeeding work pages, what we'll be doing is producing a very serviceable model that later on we'll discover gives surprisingly useful results and can be augmented to include all sorts of extra complication and so on. So this model is one that you can quite happily expect to be able to use in your professional lives into the future, unless you want to go to the complexity and detail of a package such as the Estate Master DF model. The introduction basically goes over what you're about to do, and you'll notice that there are a number of notes down the side here. Similar to the other self-correcting exercises, the data is shown in blue and the equations eventually will be written in black. You'll notice that on the left hand side here in the body we have three development costs listed. Each of the development costs has space for the finance costs, the interest costs pertinent to that particular development cost. So they form a set of inputs. Let's go through the basic data to begin with. First of all, this is a fairly simple model, although it can give, as I say, very good results. And testing on this model shows that it comes in typically between about mm, two, three, maybe up to five percent compared to, say, a completely comprehensive model such as a state master. And so typically we're looking at something which can get you within a few percent of the precise result that comes from a far more complex model. And for that reason, in a lot of cases, it's sufficient for feasibility purposes. The data we're looking at is the total development period in months in this case. In large projects, sometimes this will be calculated in quarters, but months is fairly adequate. We find that development projects tend to run from about six months at the very, very fastest for a small subdivision project to several years for a large stage to development. The next input is the finance leverage. This is the percentage of the cost of the development which is going to be covered by debt. Related to debt also is the interest rate that comes in as a percentage. And we've already noted that the interest costs will be calculated down here by development item. The first real piece of data, apart from the background parameters, is the estimated realisation. In the development industry we don't talk about sale price, we talk about realisation. And realisation reflects either the sale price or the total revenue, depending on the context. In this case, we're going to be looking at a small project which will have a total revenue or realization of $5 million. While we may be able to sell $5 million worth of property, it's going to cost us a little bit to market it and also the legal costs. And so we have a percentage here which is meant to be an estimate of how much of the sale price is actually lost in the selling expenses, legals, agents fees and so on. The next parameter, the next input, is the profit and risk margin that we're allowing the developer. The developer is not going to work for nothing, and so in this model what we're going to do is estimate what the likely rate of return is that the developer will accept. There are two ratios or two percentages which are common in the industry. Here we're going to use the profit indicator known as the development margin. The development margin is simply that percentage above costs that the total realisation equates to. In this case we're saying that the total margin above costs is going to be 19%. And so the costs 
including the finance and the profit and risk margin. Um, you add the 19% and that brings up to the $5 million. When we look at the individual development costs, we see that there's actually a number of parameters that make them up. We have simply called them development cost one, two, and three, but this could be landscaping or professional fees or contingencies or one of any a number. And you can insert extra pairs of rows in here so that you can add eventually extra development costs, depending on what level of detail you want your model to go down to. The second parameter for each development cost is related to the timing of when that development cost is going to be effective. We talk in terms of two parameters. The first is the start, or the starting month, because we're working in months. And then the span, or the period of time over which this development cost is uh, being incurred. So in this case, we're saying that we have a development cost which begins in month six, and it's going to be operating for a full 18 months. And so often, a multi-level construction project might have a construction time in this kind of vicinity, let's say a year and a half. Some larger ones will certainly be longer than that. And as I mentioned earlier, for staged developments, the span can be quite complex and long. However, this is a fairly simple, probably a single building, maybe a block of villas or something. Starts in starts six months after acquisition, after the beginning of the project, and it runs for 18 months. And the cost there is $1.2 million. The other development costs have different starts and spans. Here we have something which also starts in month six, but it only has a span one month long. That may be an architectural fee or something like that. There will be, in the real world, some development costs or charges that may start right on month one. They're usually the professional costs, such as architectural design, the legal processes and other processes to do with getting the development approval. And so we have these cost start spans and so on. The last parameter that we're interested in is an allowance for the cost of the undevelopment land. Again, this would represent agents fees and legal fees associated with the acquisition of the land because the amount of money that we're willing to pay, which is the residual land value known as the RLV, will be that amount which is left from the five million after all of these costs are all calculated and deducted and that includes the land acquisition costs. For your convenience, I have provided here a blank form. I recommend that eventually, or at least in parallel in some way, you copy this form onto a nice fresh Excel spreadsheet and save it separately. And as you go through the steps in this exercise with the self-correcting machinery purring away in the background, you also build the same set of equations into this model because this will give you a cleaner, simpler piece of code that you'll be able to save and then apply to actual jobs into the future as you require. So take the blank form, copy it onto a new Excel spreadsheet and build this model in parallel to the self-correcting one. The first stage in the self-correcting model is this third tab, which is calculation of the net funds for development. Here we see we have left quite visible those parameters, those parts of the model that we're interested in on this sheet. And we're going to be building equations to cover the yellow area here. Now these equations are either fairly straightforward, uh, such as the selling costs, the selling expenses. Here we're allowing 2%. I'm going to let you calculate that out rather than do the calculations for you on this occasion. But I want to come down here a little way and look at the calculation of profit and risk margin. For this one, the allowance of the 19%, I could say go off and do it yourself. But because this is a margin on top of the costs, the calculation for it is a little bit more involved. 
those of you who are particularly interested in mathematics might be able to reverse engineer this equation but for those of you who don't have the time or the interest you can simply copy this equation exactly as it is here into the formula bar up here and that should calculate the correct answer and get rid of that yellow highlight and this last equation down here is a simple subtraction so I'm going to leave that with you to work out and so taking out the yellow highlights here you should find fairly straightforward and it's always a nice little reward to see them disappear as you get the right answer after you've written them to here you can simply take these four equations copy them and then paste them into the model that I'm suggesting that you write in parallel uh, off um, on a separate spreadsheet. Let's move now to the second stage. Here you'll notice that I'm assuming that this first calculations are all calculated. The numbers here by the way don't have the equations in them they simply have numbers so you can cheat a little bit and see that you're actually getting the right number but I really want you to have the experience of building your own equations and getting them right so that you can independently get equations rather than simply shortcut answers here. So this is like the answers in the back of the book of your mathematics books when you're at school or whatever. The equations that are required on this exercise are the finance costs for the different development costs and there are really only two equations to write and then you can copy and paste them for as many development costs as you like. The first one is to work out the timing of the interest and so again all we have to do is write that equation in and it will calculate quite nicely so it's really just a key pressing exercise on this page. Likewise to work out the cost of the finance for development cost one it's a matter of simply applying that equation those of you again who really want the best understanding of what this model is doing would do well to reverse engineer see what this is actually doing think through the different parts of the equation how it's constructed and there are various notes and hints here along the way so you should be able to understand that equation the reason why this is important is that from time to time in practice you will need to be able to build models like this totally off your own bat not simply copy what you learnt from small back at CQ University and so I'd like you to try at least to unravel the mysteries of this ugly looking equation once you have those two again you can copy and paste them both down for the subsequent development costs but also copy and paste them into the model that you're building independently. That takes care of six of the yellow highlights. This one down here is the sum of the values above. So that's going to be a fairly simple calculation. Again, I'm not going to do it, but I would recommend that you consider using the auto sum function that you'll find up in the menu bar for the home tab menu items. That, if you haven't mastered the auto sum function already now would be a good time to do it. This yellow highlight is probably the simplest equation of all because all we're doing is bringing this result across into our major subtraction here and so this, e, this cell is simply equal to that cell and that completes this second page of the exercise. The third page is where we get the final calculations done and again we've got some fairly ugly looking equations that I do invite you to try and work through and that's why we've put both the equations in so you can simply write them into the formula bar but as well as that we're also giving you some hints so there are three equations you will notice that the two that I'm asking you to write in the two that I'm giving you examples for are for rows 31 or cell H31 and H32 and some of you will come back and say but what about cell H30 well it turns out that the mathematical derivation of H30 is very complicated if you do it straight from the numbers that are filtering through from above and of course the 24 months however it's very 
easy, well comparatively easy, some of you will probably say this equation is ugly enough to scare anybody, but that is a far easier equation than the one above it if you try and do it directly. And so I'm suggesting that you calculate H31 and then simply work out H30 as the simple difference between this figure in H28 and the rather ugly looking equation that you've written in H31. So that's just a simple subtraction. The last equation to write is the allowance for land acquisition costs and we have the equation here. Again, try and work out why that equation works and why it's more complicated than you might otherwise have expected. But if you put that in, you should have no trouble solving the last part of this problem. And lastly, the residual land value is simply what you have when you subtract from the land gross land cost the land acquisition costs. On the last page here there is the opportunity to test your results with some different data and that completes the exercise. As I say this is a very useful exercise you will be wanting to use it in a number of different uh, situations. It's a nice simple model that can make you a lot of money in the development industry unless you want to go the full deal and get something like the estate master model which costs considerably more than building your own little turner model. I hope you find this exercise useful and uh, for those of you who do take the extra trouble to build your own model and also to reverse engineer those ugly looking equations you will find it very satisfying in terms of how well it equips you for your professional future.